News of the Times. Murderous Mondays. Terrible Thomas Gardell. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, it is 1761. Thomas Gardell, originally of Geneva, has moved to London for inspiration and to make a living in his profession of artist. He lodges with a Mrs. King and seems to have a normal life. Mrs. King, it would seem, who had especially requested a portrait to be done of her, does not completely find it to her liking. She has upbraided Gardell in the past about it, in a teasing kind of way, which irritates him. On this fateful morning, she starts again about the picture, and Gardell, infuriated in broken English, calls her an impertinent woman. What unfolds next is a gruesome crime ending with dismemberment and body parts stuffed around the house. We investigate this murder and dismemberment story from 1761 London in today's episode of Murderous Mondays. Before we start the show, we would be very grateful if you would consider liking and subscribing to our channel. Help us to build a brilliant community by subscribing or liking and sharing our videos. We're on this incredible journey together. Thank you. Now, back to the terrible tale of Thomas Gardell from 1761. We hope you enjoy the show. From the Newgate Calendar, 1761. In the shadowed annals of crime, an artist met his grim fate at the gallows in the Haymarket, on the ominous date of the 4th of April in the year 1761. Theodore Gardell, a foreigner of refined education and artistic prowess, faced the public scrutiny for the heinous act of murdering a woman. The tendrils of this gruesome tale entwine themselves in the collective imagination, stirring a disquiet that lingered. Background Born in Geneva, Gardel, seeking fortune and inspiration as an artist, found his way to the labyrinthine streets of London in the year 1760. He secured lodgings at the residence of Mrs. King in the artistic haven of Leicester Fields. Little did he know that his stay there would become inexorably linked to the dark chapter that led him towards an ignominious end. The morbid details of this sordid affair emerged through the crucible of Gardell's trial and his repentant confessions that followed. The scene of the crime on the fateful morning of Thursday, the 19th of February, 1761, the household stirred to life. The maid, a humble witness to the unfolding tragedy, commenced her duties by opening the four parlour windows around seven o'clock. The dwelling, with its fore and back parlours, harboured secrets that would soon spill into the light. Doors, portals between spaces, bore witness to the clandestine acts that transpired within. Mrs. King's bedchamber, situated in the back parlour, held within its confines the unfolding drama. A locked door, guarded by an unyielding drop bolt, separated the back parlour from the passage. Simultaneously, the fore parlour door, secured by Mrs. King when she retired, held the mysteries of the night. As the morning unfolded, the maid, bearing witness to this domestic theatre, sought access to the back parlour. A ritualistic knocking, a plea for the key to the street door, echoed through the passage. Mrs. King, ensconced in her chamber, granted entry to the maid, who retrieved the key from the table, and the passage door sealed shut, the bolt dropped, and the four-parlour door swung ajar. Yet 
Beyond this seemingly mundane choreography lay the ominous undercurrents of Gardel's descent into infamy, a tale woven in the quiet moments of a household where artistry collided with the basest of human impulses. At about eight o'clock she went into Gardel's room where he lodged. Here she found him in a red and green nightgown at work. He gave her two letters, a snuff-box and a guinea, and desired her to deliver the letters and to bring him from thence a penny's worth of snuff. The girl took the messages and went again to her mistress, telling her what Gardel had desired her to do, to which the mistress replied, Nanny, you can't go, for there is nobody to answer at the street door. The girl, being willing to oblige Gardel, or being for some reason desirous to go out, answered that Mr. Gardel would come down and sit in the parlour till she came back. She then went again to Gardel and told him what objection her mistress had made and what she had said to remove it. Gardel then said he would come down, as she had proposed, and he did come down accordingly. The girl immediately went on his errand and left him in the parlour, shutting the street door after her and taking the key to let herself in when she came back. Immediately after the girl was gone out, Mrs. King, hearing the tread of somebody in the parlour, called out, Who is there? and at the same time opened her chamber door. The crime. The crime occurred in Mrs. King's bedchamber next to the parlour. Gardel was at a table very near the door, having just then taken up a book that lay upon it. He had some time before drawing Mrs. King's picture, which she wanted to have made very handsome, and had teased him so much about it that the effect was just contrary. It happened, unfortunately, that the first thing she said to him when she saw him was something reproachful about the picture he had drawn of her. Gardel was provoked at the insult and as he spoke English very imperfectly, he, for want of a less improper expression, told her, with some warmth, that she was an impertinent woman. In the labyrinth of tumultuous events, Mrs. King, propelled by a surge of fury, unleashed a vehement blow upon Gardel's chest. The force behind the strike, he noted, defied expectation as if a tempest had been wrought by the hand of a woman. The aftermath unfolded with an eerie cadence. She recoiled, and in what he claims was more contempt than anger, he sought to dismiss her with a casual push. Yet fate intervened, her foot entangled in the footcloth, and with a fateful twist she tumbled backward, her head colliding with the bedstead's unforgiving corner. In the wake of the fall, blood spewed forth, akin to the strokes of a relentless pump. Gardel, stirred by concern, rushed to her side, an expression of remorse edged across his features, but she, in defiance, pushed him away, her feeble voice intermingled with threats. Terrified by the looming spectre of condemnation for a crime he vehemently denied, Gardel, in his panic, made another futile attempt to aid her, yet her resolve remained unyielding. In a desperate bid to stifle her cries, he seized an ivory comb with a tapered point, a grooming implement from her dressing table. The threat hung in the air, but her screams persisted. In a moment of desperation, he struck her in the throat, 
intensifying the crimson cascade from her mouth, silencing her once vibrant voice. Seeking to conceal the grim tableau, he drew the bedclothes over her, shrouding her from view. As the weight of the gruesome act settled upon him, he stood in a disorientated stupor, momentarily paralysed by the magnitude of his actions. A swoon enveloped him, and consciousness ebbed away. Upon regaining his senses, he found the maid had entered the house. In a daze, he exited Mrs. King's bedchamber without scrutinising Mrs. King's lifeless form, leaving the tragic scene behind. His confusion reached a crescendo as he staggered colliding with the wainscot, marking his brow with the tell-tale bump. The Chilling Account Encapsulated in Gardell's recollections stands as the sole testament to the fateful event. Yet, within the narrative fabric, inconsistencies linger, casting shadows of doubt upon the veracity of his tale. The Maid Be that as it may, tranquillity reigned upon the maid's return, a period she estimates to be no more than a quarter of an hour. Her initial destination was the parlour, where Gardell had pledged to await her return, yet the room greeted her with emptiness. Having disbursed three shillings and ninepence from the guinea during her errand to the snuff-box, she deposited the change and the acquired snuff-box on the table. Ascending to Gardell's chamber, she found it vacant, subsequently traversing every room in the domicile, excluding her mistress's chamber, a realm she only entered upon summons. Initiating a modest repast, she heard footsteps overhead in the parlour or passage, ascending the stairs, yet opted not to investigate the source. Contemplating her breakfast, she stoked the fire in the parlour, anticipating her mistress awakening. It was during this moment that she noted the absence of both the snuff and the change from the table. Proceeding once more to Gardell's room, she undertook the customary cleaning and tidying routine, a task typically performed between ten and eleven o'clock. Gardell descended from the garret into his bedchamber shortly thereafter, a development she found perplexing, as she could discern no ostensible reason for his presence in the garret. An hour lapsed before the maid laid eyes upon Gardell once more. To her keen observation he appeared disconcerted, his countenance flushed with an intense embarrassment. The conspicuous bump above his eye, adorned with a sizable black patch, testified to a recent encounter. The Concealment Clad in an altered attire, Gardell had also penned another missive, dispatching her to Great Suffolk Street with instructions to await a response. She promptly executed the errand, returning within a quarter of an hour to find Gardell seated in the parlour. In a revelation he shared that a gentleman had visited her mistress and they had departed together in a hackney coach. The narrative hinted at Gardell's awareness of the maid's familiarity with her mistress's proclivities. Scepticism crept into the maid's mind. The temporal constraints made the tale implausible. Her mistress, initially in bed, could not have entertained a visitor, donned appropriate attire, arranged for a coach, and absconded within the brief interlude of the maid's absence. Moreover, upon her return, 
she found Gardel ensconced in her mistress's chamber. Although suspicions began to burgeon, they refrained from veering into more sinister territory. The maid harboured a notion that Gardel and her mistress had shared a bed. Undeterred, she ventured to inspect her mistress's bedchamber, which connected to the parlour and had been unlocked at her mistress's behest, only to discover it once again secured. Around one o'clock another resident, Mr. Wright's servant Thomas Pelsey, arrived at the door, advising the maid to prepare the beds as his master intended to arrive late in the evening. The maid, growing increasingly perplexed by her mistress's prolonged absence, surmised that shame had confined her to her chamber, particularly since the maid had returned from her errand whilst Gardel still occupied the room. Removing the maid. Meanwhile, Gardel traversed the stairs frequently, and at approximately three o'clock he dispatched the maid with a letter addressed to one brochette at the Eagle and Pearl in Suffolk Street. Anticipating the challenges of concealing the impending murder with the maid still present, Gardel harboured a desire to discharge her. However, hampered by the maid's inability to write and his limited proficiency in the English language, he enlisted Mr. Brochette in the letter, requesting him to compose a receipt for the maid to sign upon receiving her payment, all without divulging his ulterior motive. Upon perusing the letter, Mr. Brochette inquired whether the maid was aware of Gardel's intention to dismiss her. Obviously, to this impending decision, the maid expressed her surprise. According to Mr. Brochette, Mrs. King had gone out and left instructions for Gardel to discharge the maid, as she intended to return with another maid. The maid, however, confidently asserted that her mistress was still at home. Persisting in her belief that her mistress's avoidance was rooted in shame, the maid accepted her dismissal. Between three and four in the afternoon she encountered Gardel in the parlour alongside an unidentified gentleman. Gardel settled her wages and presented her with an additional five or six shillings. In return she handed him the receipt drafted by Brochette, collected her belongings and departed. As she made her exit, Mr. Wright's servant returned to the door, and she informed him of her dismissal, narrating how her mistress had confined herself to the bedchamber all day, deprived of sustenance. The Body Gardel's initial action was to enter the bedchamber where the lifeless body lay. Upon inspection, he confirmed the woman's demise. Removing the blankets and sheets used to conceal the body, he exposed it entirely, discarding the blood-stained garment. He recounted that his linen was unstained until this point, but the act of moving the body marred it significantly. Subsequently, he immersed the tainted blankets, sheets, coverlet, and one curtain in the water tub at the back wash house, for soaking. Carrying Mrs. King's bloody shift upstairs, he stowed it away in a bag concealed beneath his bed, stripping off his now blood-stained shirt. He secured it in a drawer of his bureau. With these clandestine tasks accomplished, he settled in the parlour. Around nine o'clock, Pelsey, Mr. Wright's servant, reappeared. The servant ascended to his garret, 
where he lingered until approximately seven o'clock. Descending once more, he found Gardell in the parlour and inquired about Mrs. King's return. Gardell revealed her absence, but pledged to await her. Where is Mrs. King? On Friday morning, when Pelsey descended the stairs, he again questioned Gardell about Mrs. King's whereabouts. Gardell asserted that she had returned, but left again. Inquiring about the injury to Gardell's eye, Pelsey was informed that it resulted from wood-cutting for the morning fire. Pelsey then attended to his master's affairs. Upon his return in the evening, Gardell admitted him once more, assuring him that he would again stay up for Mrs. King that night. On the morning of Saturday, Pelsey once again inquired about Mrs. King's whereabouts. Gardell, despite claiming to have stayed up for her the previous night, informed him that she had gone to Bath or Bristol. Yet, remarkably, no suspicion of murder seemed to have arisen at this point. Later that day, Mosier, an acquaintance of Gardell's and also familiar with Mrs. King, arrived by appointment at around two or three o'clock. Having spent the evening with her just before the murder, Mosier had promised to accompany her to the opera that night. Gardell, who had previously informed Pelsey of Mrs. King's supposed journey, let Mosier in and repeated the same story. Observing Gardell's evident distress, Mosier and another acquaintance believed it was due to Mrs. King's absence. The Dismemberment Throughout this time, the deceased body remained undisturbed as Gardell had left it on Thursday night. He had not entered the room since. However, on this particular night, Gardell conceived a plan to conceal or dismember the body. He went downstairs to carry out his scheme, but was startled by others and returned upstairs. In the morning of Sunday, Gardell rose between seven and eight. It is conceivable that during this time he was occupied with the body, as it was noted that between ten and eleven he had just started to light the parlour fire. Having requested staff to find a charwoman the previous night, a Mrs. Pritchard was hired. On Monday night, Pelsey once again inquired about Mrs. King, and Gardell told him she was at Bath or Bristol, uncertain of, of her exact location. He provided inconsistent details about her, yet no suspicion of murder has arisen. On Tuesday morning, Pelsey detected an offensive odour. He questioned Gardell, who was adjusting the window sash on the staircase, about the smell. Gardell responded that someone had put a bone in the fire. The truth, however, was that Gardell had been burning some of Mrs. King's bones in the garret. On the following night, Percy persisted in his inquiries about Mrs. King, prompting Gardell to respond with an apparent impatience. I know not of Mrs. King. She gives me a great deal of trouble, but I shall hear of her Wednesday or Thursday. Nevertheless, he continued to talk about waiting for her, and throughout this period no one seemed to entertain any suspicions of murder. On Tuesday night, Gardell resumed his gruesome task, of dismembering the body and dispersing it in various locations. He disposed of the bowels down the necessary, the toilet, and the chopped flesh of the body and limbs were scattered about the cockloft, where he hoped they would desiccate and decay without putrefaction. The Damning Bed Linen Wednesday and Thursday unfolded much like the preceding days. Pritchard, the charwoman, persisted in her duties. 
With the cistern running dry on Tuesday, Pritchard resorted to the water tub in the back kitchen upon withdrawing the spigot. Only a small amount of water emerged. Suspecting more water inside, she climbed onto a ledge, inserting her hand, only to encounter something soft. Fetching a poker, she pressed down on the contents, managing to collect enough water in a pail. Despite this discovery, their curiosity waned, and it wasn't until Thursday that they examined the tub. Within the large wash tub they found the blankets, sheets, and coverlet that Gardel had submerged, and after inspecting, shaking, and displaying them, they returned the linens to the tub. The following morning, as Pelsey observed Gardel emerging from the wash house door, upon the charwoman's arrival, Pelsey questioned her about the clothes, and she denied taking any, but discovered the sheets had been wrung out. With no maid and no Mrs. King, Pelsey the lodger was puzzled to see wet bedclothes, blankets and sheets. Pritchard, the charwoman, confirmed that she had had nothing to do with the wet linen. This marked the initial steps towards uncovering the fate of the woman who had lain dead in the house for over a week. The Investigation Pelsey, now tremendously concerned regarding the Mrs. Mrs. King, sought out the dismissed maid, inquiring if she had placed bedclothes in the water. Alarmed, she denied it. Pelsey, in turn, informed his master. These details reached the awareness of Mr. Barron, a local apothecary. He visited Mrs. King's house, questioning Gardell about her whereabouts. Trembling and in great confusion, Gardell claimed she had gone to Bath. Consequently, the next day, Saturday, Baron brought the maid before Mr. Fielding, the Justice Magistrate, to record her statement and secured a warrant for Gardell's arrest. Accompanied by the constables and others, they confronted Gardell, accusing him of murder. Initially he denied it, but soon fainted. Upon regaining consciousness, they demanded access to Mrs. King's chamber. Gardell insisted she had taken the key with her to the country. The constable, however, entered through the window, unlocking the door connected to the parlour. The Discovery Inside, they discovered wet blankets, unused sheets, and the curtain initially seen in the water tub, and later on the banisters now restored to its place. As they removed the bedclothes, evidence of blood stains emerged, and the blankets were soaked in blood. The bed also exhibited blood marks, and seizing Gardel's keys, they ascended to his room where they found the blood-stained shirt and shift. Gardel, burdened by these damning signs of his culpability, was brought before the magistrate, steadfastly refuting the charges, but ultimately detained. On the ensuing Monday, a carpenter and a bricklayer were dispatched to scour the house for the body accompanied by Mr. Barron. In the necessary, they encountered what Baron identified as the bowels of a human body, and in the cockloft they discovered a solitary breast, assorted muscular fragments and bones. The remnants hinted at a recent fire in the garret, with partially consumed bone fragments located in the chimney, unmistakably human. Earlier on the Thursday, Gardel had delivered an oval chip box to Perigneux, a friend of his. Gardel requested Perigneux to safeguard it, citing unease about leaving it at Mrs. King's while she was away in Bath. Upon 
Gardel's arrest, Perignon opened the box, relieving a gold watch and chain, bracelets and earrings unmistakably belonging to Mrs. King. Faced with this overwhelming evidence, Gardel finally relented, admitting to the crime without formally signing a confession. The Arrest He was then confined in New Prison, where he attempted suicide by ingesting opium, a remedy he had kept for toothache. In a single dose of 40 grains, contrary to his intentions, the opium failed to induce sleep. Gardel, who claimed not to have slept since the crime, continued sleepless for over a fortnight. Undeterred, he ingested a dozen half-pence, causing considerable pain and distress, but failing to elicit fatal symptoms. This is particularly noteworthy, given that verdigris, a copper solution, is a potent poison, and the stomach's contents typically act as a solvent upon it. On the 2nd of March, he found himself within the walls of Newgate, under vigilant scrutiny, to thwart any renewed self-harm endeavours, displaying conspicuous signs of remorse, he conducted himself with profound penitence, humility and affability towards those who ventured to converse with him. The Trial On Thursday the 2nd of April, Thomas Gardell stood trial at the Old Bailey. In his defence, he contended solely that he harboured no ill towards the deceased, attributing her demise to an accidental fall. Nevertheless, the verdict was conviction, and the sentence dictated his execution on Saturday the 4th. The written account he penned in prison, referenced in this chronicle, bears the date of the 28th of March, although he withheld its communication until after the trial. The night following his condemnation witnessed erratic and tumultuous behaviour, yet the subsequent morning saw him composed and tranquil, asserting that he had managed to sleep for three or four hours during the night. He disclaimed any intention of robbing Mrs. King, contending that he merely rearranged certain items to lend credence to the narrative of her journey to Bath. He also asserted a lack of amorous or jealous sentiments towards Mrs. King. The Execution Gardell faced the gallows amidst the clamorous disapproval and disdainful hisses of an outraged public. The grim spectacle unfolding in the Haymarket, proximate to Panton Street, the sombre procession briefly paused at Mrs. King's residence, a fleeting moment marked by a gaze from the condemned man. Subsequently, his lifeless form swung in chains upon Hanslow Heath, notably absent throughout the entire period of Mrs. King's absence were inquiries from a single relative or friend. Lessons Learned The revelation of the murder unfolded through the efforts of strangers bereft of genuine concern or investigation. The perpetrator was apprehended by unfamiliar hands, and it was strangers who steered the prosecution against him. Contemplating this, one might ponder if an individual of upright character, regardless of their station, were to vanish for even a day, wouldn't their absence elicit a cascade of earnest inquiries, kindling a relentless quest for truth and justice that would brook no respite? That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, Terrible Thomas Gardell. We hope you enjoyed the show.
If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. For our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us to build this channel. The News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.